Uh, okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Cathy. Um, I'm not going to do, uh, do uh, a long presentation. I want to simply pick up some of the issues that have been raised over the last two days, particularly and um, commencing with uh, the issues that were raised in the first session yesterday. Um, when we had a report amongst uh, other parts of the, the, the presentation um, about the situation at Stasix and the outsourcing. And I want to start there simply because uh, certainly as a member of the National Executive of the UCU, um, there were voiced um, some trenchant criticisms of our organisation and uh, the parlous response to the challenge of neoliberalism to the universities and the attempt to undermine um, what goes on. And I, I have to start by saying that, unfortunately, I can't enter into uh, the sort of... Um, vociferous defense of, of, of the UCU that I'd like to in, in response to those criticisms that came from a UCU member uh, and a colleague um, at, at the University of Sussex. Um, and that is because uh, it is the case that despite our union having strong policy against neoliberalism, despite our union having policies, for example, in favor of a boycott of the research assessment exercise, despite our union having policy overwhelmingly carried at successive conferences against the National Student Survey, uh, and a policy to consider the boycott of the National Student Survey, um, because of its anti-educational consequences, um, the union has not implemented those policies. It's not come up with a, a set of ways in which they could be implemented to avoid, to avoid their, their worst excesses. And I think it's an address to those kinds of questions that is useful for us, not as a defense of trade unionism against the new forms of organization that are emerging, for instance, at the University of Sussex. For those who might want to counterpose uh, traditional trade unionism to the pop-up union at Sussex, I would simply say, you just simply have to look at what those organizing the pop-up union are saying about it. They're not saying that this is an alternative to trade unionism in the sector or more generally. They're saying this is an opportunity for people to provoke the unions into doing the kinds of things that they should be doing. And that's really what I want to address. What, uh, what is the relationship between the defense of a higher education worth the name and trade unionism on the other hand? What's the relationship between a general commitment to a political vision of what a university is about on the one hand and the defense of the sectional interests, whether those be interests of pay, jobs or conditions that can be delivered by uh, a trade union in, in the sector? And I think a good place to start in, in reflecting on those things is to ask what it is that uh, all of us who have been engaged what, from whatever our backgrounds, whether we be academics, students, or, uh, or um, non-academic staff in the universities that have been discussing this over the past uh, two days, what is it that we have to do? What is the nature of the uphill struggle, as somebody described it, that we have to engage in? Well, I think that John's uh, excellent introduction here to the, to the background gives us one answer to those questions. It is not the case, it seems to me, that the key task that we have is to defend the idea of a university committed to traditional values of a university, however uh, one might want to quibble with elements of those traditional values. We don't have to defend that to the general public. Whether the general public understands the operation of a university as well as those of us in it, whether we be students or staff working for it or not, that general public is evidentially strongly in support of access to it for themselves, but more importantly for their children. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that we should become, in my view, complacent about it. It means, for instance, that if we are to defend those traditional values, it requires us to explain in much greater detail to the outside world how those traditional values work, precisely in what ways they contribute to the public good way beyond the private interests that are served by those who happen to secure degrees and may or may not secure higher incomes as a result of those degrees in the future. That is an exercise of explanation that I think that we still have to engage in and engage with. Um, it's also the case, it seems to me, that in respect of providing this explanation, this account, the provision of this information, we also have to have a vision that takes us on beyond those traditional values. If a university is going to meet those traditional values in the kind of society 
that we heard spoken about by the Vice Chancellor of Salford earlier today, then in that transformed world, the university simply cannot be the same university it was in the past. But that doesn't mean it transforms itself into the neoliberal marketized university, which precisely could not deliver what a university might deliver in that changed world. So what else are we engaged in a struggle over? Well, are we engaged, for instance, in a struggle to persuade governments or political parties to change their policies, to alter that which they want to do to the university in the interests of what they describe as modernization? Or are we engaged in an attempt to persuade vice chancellors and principals in higher education institutions to change their mind? Well, I think the answer to that categorically has to be no. We're not in, engaged in that game, except I'll make a caveat to that in a moment. I think the reason that we're not engaged in that game, certainly not engaged in the exercise of attempting to change government policy, at least the coalition's policy, is amply evidenced by what I thought, and though he's not here, I'm sure he won't mind me repeating what I said to him face to face last night in the pub after his contribution, when Will Hutton uh, made the claim that market fundamentalism, which was discussed yesterday, is not any longer at the heart of what the present government stands for. And he gave the evidence of the fact that it itself is engaged in a strong form of state interventionism. It's plowing two billion pounds into the aerospace industry to reposition British aerospace industry in, in relation to international competition. And he gave other elements of evidence as well, the ways in which, quite, quite contrary to the principles of market fundamentalism, he was observing the ways in which even the government's intervention in, in the higher education sector is more like a Stalinist intervention in the higher education sector than that would have been recognized by uh, the liberal, uh, the, the radical liberal uh, Austrian economists, Hayek and Mises. In other words, tight control of uh, student numbers, etc. What I said to him last night, and uh, what I would uh, repeat now, is that this is a fundamental mistake. And he actually, after a long argument, and two pints, I think, accepted it last night. Um, uh, it's a mistake simply because, just because there might temporarily be reasons of policy to intervene that are contrary to the principles that, under, that underscore the overall policy program of a government doesn't mean that the policy program has been abandoned. The fact that the government is keeping tight control of student numbers because of the fear that what they have created will produce a system that will actually be more costly to the Treasury than than, than the one that, that is designed to replace, is a short-term intervention. It doesn't mean that they've abandoned the, the idea of insti uh, universities as separate competing institutions that will operate on the marketplace and will, as a consequence, have the sorts of consequences that we've been dis discussing today. So I think that he, he was simply wrong about that. He was also, um, as, as a, and there was a discussion about it yesterday as well, wrong to say that the exercise in my view, can simply be about the preservation of the autonomy of, of, of universities. I mean, the autonomy of universities, as somebody said in the discussion earlier today, and I forget who it was, the autonomy of universities in a privatized, market-driven system is actually the worst of all worlds. It's not the preservation of university autonomy as it was. It allows an autonomy to vice chancellors or to those who work with them in privatized institutions of that, type, of that kind to progress the process of competition rather than to restrict it in any way. That's not a preservation of the autonomy that underscores academic freedom. That precisely is an autonomy that allows them, as autonomous market-driven institutions, to interfere necessarily with academic freedom if that academic freedom is not producing the kinds of research, not producing the kinds of teaching that they want to market to the segment of the market that they think that their institution is, is related to. So if we're not engaged in attempting to change the minds of this government, this coalition government, or uh, a, a subsequent uh, government that might be made up of the, con of the Conservative Party because their market fundamentalism has not been um, put aside, in my view, are we then trying to change the opinions of vice chancellors um, to persuade them that they ought to be putting out a more rigorous defense of the institutions that are facing the assaults being brought to them by, by government, and again, I'm afraid that my answer to that, and I think evidenced by some of the remarks that we heard this weekend, not least from um, 
um, Martin Hall and from Peter Scott, uh, one the current Vice Chancellor, another in a previous incarnation a, a, a Vice Chancellor of a different institution, um, that though it's true that all Vice Chancellors are not the same when it comes to an orientation to what this neoliberal policy means, for the vast majority of them, it would seem, and the evidence seems to suggest that it's the case, that there is less concern uh, from them about the preservation of what is good about the past or having a vision of how universities could extend their remit into the future, and much more about the qualifications that being vice-chancellor constitute for the knighthood of the future or some preferment of, of another kind. So um, I have not done a, sur a survey of vice-chancellors in my opinion. <coughs> I'm, I'm too old to, to face the disappointment, I suspect, of, of trying that. But I think that, given uh, the remarks made, uh, certainly by Professor Hall today, that, that um, I'm fairly confident that that view um, would be secured. Are we then trying to change the view of a potential alternative political party? Well, we might be doing that. We might well be doing that. We might well be asking of the, whatever it is, 165 universities that occupy some, uh, what, uh, 130 different constituencies in the political map of Britain, which of those are marginal constituencies, the outcome of which election will, could largely be determined by whether staff and students vote one way rather than the other. Um, the unfortunate thing about that, however, is that, as I suggested to Will Hutton last night in the pub, just before he finished the second pint, that his dinner last night with Ed Miliband was unlikely to produce the kinds of results that he expected, because it seemed to me to be unlikely um, that the leader of, the, of Her Majesty's loyal opposition is going to put himself into a position of defending a return to an absence of a fee structure. The lack of vision that we have seen up to now is not going to produce, I would suggest, um, uh, even a recognition that if the most powerful country in Europe decides that the damage to its universities from fees is something that it can't countenance, and Germany has just, I believe, announced the abolition of all its fees, that the lack of vision that we've seen politically on how to win, how to win an election, just how to win an election, not to change the world, but just how to win an election, is not going to shift the opposition. So whether that leave us, I think that does leave us, in a sense, talking amongst those who have a vision or who want a vision for a future higher education system. In other words, not a vision for a future institution or set of institutions with which they might have an allegiance or for whom or for, for which they might work, but a vision of a system, a system of higher education, differentiated in a variety of different ways, perhaps, addressing different constituencies, perhaps, but nevertheless a system committed to the notion of an educated citizenry a critically equipped and educated citizenry, whether that be in the fields of the natural sciences, the social sciences, or, or, or the humanities. And what does that mean then? That means speaking to the trade unions and the trade unionists who work in those institutions. It means speaking to the staff who are not members of those organizations. It means speaking to those professors and others, and even vice chancellors, who have joined the Council for the Defense of British Universities, it means cohering together, in my view, those who not only support the Council, but will support the campaign for the public university, whether they be members of a trade union or not. And trade unions are important in this. They're important in this, in the, in the sense that if a conference was called on a national basis to defend higher education, if, as a result of debates that might happen over the su subsequent year, that conference was to be organized, which organization is in a position not only to survive over a long period, but to have its tentacles, as it were, in every single institution? That is only the union. However poorly or inadequately it might have pursued good policies that its delegates have voted for, it nevertheless is an organizational structure that can do it. But that's not the only space 
One of the important discussions that I think took, that took place today was the importance of not uh, hemming in this discussion as if it's simply about the already qualified people who work in an institution, either as administrators or as technicians or as, or, or as academic staff, but to recognize that the most powerful potential voice and the most powerful potential source of imagination from the, for the future is actually in the student body itself. And that's where I think uh, it is important for us to transgress the limits or the sectional boundaries that separate staff from students and find a way of having this discussion on, on a much wider, much wider basis. Um, there is information that is available to staff that is not available to students, and if students don't have it, they are disempowered. There is a hope a willingness, a determination, a vision that exists, certainly for the activists amongst students, that is all too often missing amongst the staff as they stare towards their preferment in their institutions or consider their research careers or their future promotion or their status in the institutions that they serve. And finally, we have to have an argument in our own union about this. And I think that that is one of the most important things to happen. It was interesting, I think, that at a recent conference of our union in February of this year, when we were discussing the union's pay claim and the failure of the union successfully to be able to defend pensions and going into a pay battle to try to recruit some of the 17% cut, 16, 17% cut in, in living standards over the last few years, there was an overwhelming vote in favor of a, of a motion that said we cannot any longer pursue sectional interests as if we are simply a trade union that is there to defend jobs, pay, and pensions. We have to be a union that links that to a defense of the sector as a whole, of the idea of a university. Indeed, a modernized idea of the university, but not modernized in the way that the neoliberal ideologues would want to, to paint that picture. And that has to be the joint struggle because it is indeed the case, is it not, that even the defense of a university is something that requires mobilization. Unless we can mobilize people around the things that might interest them now and immediately, that defense of the British higher education system and a vision for the future, I think, is not going to be there. And what that means in practice uh, is a defense of a whole series of elements of the contractual terms of staff, not just academic staff, all staff. But amongst academic staff, for instance, it means the defense of self-managed scholarly activity. It means the defense of that scholarly activity that is self-managed and is not, um, is not uh, performance managed by somebody else. It means that. It means the defense of the idea of an academic as somebody who engages in teaching and research. And that does mean a difficult argument with some colleagues who might not be too keen to do research, that actually, well, you can't do the teaching properly in a higher education institution unless in some sense you're engaged in research. That will not be popular among some of our colleagues, but it needs to be said. And I think that uh, uh, trade unions uh, officers, in some sense, need to be saying that to colleagues as well. But they need to be saying equally to managers that if you are intent in splitting the academic staff into those who are, quotes, unquote, proper academics and those who simply, simply deliver teaching, that teaching only contracted staff, then you are not part of the solution to the future of higher education and the resistance to this neoliberal dystopia that we face. You are part of the problem, if that's uh, what you are engaged in. And pay and pensions and academic tutoring and all of those things that are enshrined in various parts of the contract. It's linking these things, the power of that collective organization, to the power of a vision that I think the future defense of higher education, and not just its defense, but an aggressive move to make universities the sorts of things that I suspect that everybody in this room who came into them to teach wanted, and I suspect is the kind of vision that would mobilize the majority of staff who work in them, whether they be academics or not. Thank you.